Shavu Atov. I gave a sermon this morning that I want to share now. Usually I see it as my job to uplift. You'll constantly hear me say that it's our job to find ways to celebrate, to cheer, smile, and sing together. But that's not what I'm gonna do right now. The other thing I wanna acknowledge is that I'm going to talk about the events of the last week and I am not an African American, I'm not a black person. I'm a Jewish person who easily and regularly passes as white. But despite that, I want to try and put into some perspective what this all might mean for us as the Woodbury Jewish Center and maybe as a Jewish community. I wanna talk about anti-Semitism. I wanna talk about violence. And I want to talk about some nonviolent moments. And every single anti lecture on anti Semitism, every time there's a talk, every time there's a conversation, at some point someone raises a hand and asks, But how do we get our allies? How do we get other communities to stand up for us? And the first thing we hear in response always is we have to be there for other communities when they need us. So the first thing my and maybe our history with anti-Semitism teaches me is that when someone else says they need us, we have to be there. We have to be present. The second question that usually comes up is something about Holocaust deniers. Or how come people don't believe that anti-Semitism is a thing? Don't they know the terrible things we've endured? Why won't they hear our stories? So the second thing it tells me is that it's our job to listen when others say they experience fear and oppression when they're not taken seriously. It's our job to hear that story and we hear it over and over again from different geographies and different situations. And the third thing is a little bit different. There is a moment that happens when you go to a lecture on anti-Semitism where they say, and if something goes wrong, you immediately call the police. And it's an amazing moment for Jews in history. It's astounding. Jews have never been able to call the non-Jewish authorities to come help us, to come save us. That's not the way the world has worked for us. It's a remarkable moment of safety. Not only that, but Jews, especially and mostly pale-skinned Jews who, who pass as white, when they hear a siren, when we hear a siren, we feel safe. It's amazing. And the stories that we're listening to tell us that it's also a privilege. It's a privilege that we don't have to teach our kids what to do when you're pulled over by the police, how to stay alive. The second thing I want to talk about is Violence. Now we know, by all accounts, the vast majority of the protests over the last week and a half have been extraordinarily peaceful. And we know that a number of the violent moments have been instigated both by white supremacist groups trying to increase conflict and distract from the story and the, uh, and the move towards more equity, and that on top of that, there are foreign actors who seek to divide our country, who are using social media and other tools to try and incite more violence. But even with that, of course, of course, we say that looting and destruction of property and violence is not okay. And yet, it's not obvious in Jewish tradition that violence is always not okay. In fact, if you go back to the beginning, the story of uh, our redemption story from slavery, 
is that for hundreds of years we were oppressed by the Egyptians and God sent the 10 plagues that destroyed Egypt's stuff, that destroyed their livelihood as punishment, as response. Now we as a tradition have evolved and don't want violence as the answer, but I can understand the desire for violence in response to injustice. I can understand. Next, I want to talk about the nonviolent moments. Because while this week's protests have been sparked by the apparent murder of one man, there are two other stories I want to tell first that have been in the news. One is a woman walk, a white woman walking her dog in the park off the leash. And a black man comes and says, please, can you put your dog on a leash? And she says, even though that was the rules for the park, she says, I'm going to call the police. And I'm going to tell them that a black man is harassing me. Because intuitively, she understood that the way the system works is that when that altercation took place that she would be believed and he would not. The second was another story. A white woman looks out her window and sees a man, an African American man and is afraid and says that guy is a danger and calls the police and they find out he was bird watching. There's a million stories like this. I shared one on Facebook of a man, a tall African-American man who likes to go for walks in his neighborhood, but he makes sure he takes his cute white fluffy dog or his young daughters with him so people know he's not scary. When I think about the death of George Floyd, when I think of the horror of the eight minutes and 45 seconds that there was a knee on this man's neck and he was saying, I can't breathe. Yes, I feel fury at the man whose neck, whose knee was on his neck. But what keeps me up at night is the other three. Every system, no matter how just, no matter how perfect, will there will be a bad apple, a bad seed who finds his or her way through to do something bad. But there were three men who for eight minutes and 45 seconds stood around three other officers and listened to a man say, I can't breathe. I can't breathe. And they thought the safest thing for them to do was nothing. That they understood in that moment all they should do was nothing. Now, it's worth noting that all four of those people have been charged with crimes, but the, the, the zeitgeist, the, the fact of our society behind that notion that that was the safe and or right thing to do was nothing in that moment says that something is broken in the way we function as a society. So what do we do? As Jews, our experience with anti-Semitism teaches us that we have to be there, that we have to listen, that we have to recognize our privilege. What do we do? I'm gonna suggest three things. The first is a comment I'll put below in this uh, video, below this video, which is to read, to watch, to listen, and to donate. So that look for black voices and learn their story. There are some articles to read that I'll, I'll post below, like I said. The second 
is to amplify those voices. We all have platforms now, social media, or it could just be our friends and family. Pick a story. Instead of sharing our own comments, pick a story of an African-American and share it. Pick their words and share it. And third, For 3,000 years, we have turned to the book of Psalms as a source of comfort. They are our first attempt at organized prayer. There are 150 Psalms. Each one tries to reach out to God, some in praise, some in challenge, some asking for a better world. And the last line of the last Psalm, Psalm 150, ends with the wor words, Kol Hanishama Te Halelia. May every breath praise God. When God created humanity, God forms Adam out of dirt and breathes the breath of life into him. Only then does he become a partner in making this world a better place. During this pandemic, during this time when I counsel people, when I myself need counseling, the first advice is take a breath. For eight minutes and 45 seconds, a man who was handcuffed with a knee on his neck said, I can't breathe. The third thing I suggest is to ask ourselves, what are we doing to make sure the world we live in is one where each and every breath praises God? What are we doing to live in a world where each person can breathe? Shavuot Tov.